um, muted, so please mute your mic um, unless you're speaking. If at any time um, during communications from the public or when Mayor Mulfeld opens the public hearing, if you choose to speak or you would like to speak, please look to the right hand side if you're on the web um, and at the participant page um, or the participant list, please uh, hover over your name and you should see something that looks like a hand. Go ahead and click that and that is called raising your hand and so once uh, we see that your hand's raised and we're open to the public for speaking, I will unmute you, um, call your name out, and then you'll be able to speak. For those that are on the phone, please use the star three to raise your hand, and then also the star three to lower your hand. And uh, John, I think whenever you're ready, we're ready to go. Thanks very much, Michelle. I'll go ahead and call this November 2nd, 2020 meeting of the Whitefish. City Council to order. This is being held remotely via WebEx, and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us this evening. I know it's difficult um, and technical challenges are always arise, so please be patient with us, and we'll be patient with you, and we'll get through this. But thanks again for participating in your government this evening. And I would ask first that Michelle, can you please take a roll call of the council present, please? Sure. Councillor Quinnell? Here. Here. Councillor Sweeney? Here. Councillor Davis. Present. Councillor Hennon. Here. Councillor Fury. Here. Councillor Norton. Here. Mayor Mulfeld. Present. You want me to run through the staff also? Yes, please, Michelle. City Manager Smith. Here. City Attorney Jacobs. Finance Director Dolman. Here. And Public Works Director Workman. Here. And that's all I see right now. Great. Thanks very much, Michelle. And we'll move on to our first order of business, which is our Pledge of Allegiance. And Ryan Hennon, do you mind leading us this evening? Yeah, no problem. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Councillor Hennon. Appreciate that. We will move on to communications from the public. If you are joining us this evening to speak to our one public hearing which is related to COVID-19 community measures. I would just ask that you wait until I call that public hearing later in the evening. But if you have anything else to bring to the attention of the council, now would be your opportunity and to facilitate communications from the public. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Chris Hunt, our IT specialist who can acknowledge you. Thanks, Chris. So Chris is off for the night, so I'll be the one that would be able to do that. Um, let me admit some people here. So we have a phone number that ends with the number 31. I will unmute you. You're, you should be able to speak. Phone number that ends with 31. Are you on the line? Just muting. I will unmute you. Can you hear me? Let's try that. Okay, there you go. Okay, yeah, I was trying to lower my hand. I'll raise it back up when we get to the, the COVID thing. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Betsy Kohlenstam, are you? I also raised, raised my hand at the wrong moment. Excuse me. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other, John, um, it looks like there's nobody here to speak towards the communications from the public. Great, 
<clears throat> Thank you, Michelle. That will bring us quickly on to our consent agenda. Are there any changes or additions to the minutes from the October 19th special as well as regular sessions? And I will go first to Andy. Andy, any changes or additions? Uh, none. Thank you, Andy. Ben? Frank? No changes. Thank you, Frank. Rebecca? Yes, I have one change. Um, Michelle has this, but it's page, the special session was fine. Page 49, um, on the fifth line up, Mary Flowers, it should read, it is an important and complex. And then the second change is adding an S at the end of needs. Otherwise, thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Ryan, any additions, corrections? No, sir. Thank you, sir. Steve? Nothing, thank you. With that said, I will entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda, which includes ordinance 20-15. I would move to uh, approve the consent agenda. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Quinnell. Michelle, roll call, please. Councillor Quinnell. Uh, in favor. Councillor Sweeney. In favor. Councillor Davis. In favor. Councillor Hennon. Aye. Councillor Fury. Aye. Councillor Norton. Aye. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And that's unanimously, as you know. Uh, that brings us on to item five of our agenda, which is our one public hearing this evening. It's item 5A, which is consideration and direction after hearing a public uh, after hearing public comments on COVID-19 community measures, including consideration of reestablishing some of the guidelines in the state of Montana's phase one directive. And this appears on page 122 of the packet. For those here this evening, I want to assure you that the purpose of tonight is to hear from our businesses and the general public as well as the city council on their thoughts regarding additional uh, community measures uh, this evening we will not be acting on additional measures nothing will be legislated this evening uh, our outcome this evening is to provide direction back to our city staff for a future council meeting if there is momentum in that direction from uh, the council. And that will be after we hold our public hearing because we do have quite a few participants this evening out of respect for our time. I would just ask that you limit your comment to about three minutes, uh, please. With that said, uh, I'll turn it back to Dana. Um, would you like to uh, direct this public hearing or present the staff report or would you like Angie to do so? Well, yeah, both wrote the staff report, so I'll start and I'll turn it over to Angie. How about that? That sounds um, great. Um, so in your packet, um, we've included a staff report on page 122. Um, as requested by the council at our last meeting, we did research some different topics, um, including enforcement capability, um, the ability of the city to even enact additional restrictions, um, as well as some other data related to our resort tax um, and business business um, information. So um, I might actually have Angie start out with just to kind of flow through the staff report, have her start out with the, the information regarding our ability to enact restrictions first. Sure. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, so at our last meeting, um, the council asked um, us in particular to look at some, um, whether or not we had the ability to enact some further restrictions. And you guys are probably very tired of me telling you that you are a charter city, but you are. And we may exercise any power not prohibited by the constitutional law or the charter. So as a charter city, we do have some broad authority to enact some restrictions. Um, you know, in Governor Bullock's last directive, he basically said that his directive superseded any local restrictions, but he's the county restrictions. And as we know, the county is not willing to enact any restrictions um, that weren't inconsistent with his order. 
So, you know, as a charter city, we do have broad powers and we, we do have the power to enact some restrictions as long as they're not inconsistent with what the state is doing. Um, you know, I, I, I think to go more restrictive, could we defend it? Yes, we could. I mean, that's a, that's a council call for sure. Um, another question that was asked, I think, by Councillor Quinnell is whether the city is constrained by the municipal infraction fines that is in our city code, which right now is $300 for a first offense and $500 for a second violation. Every day is a different violation. Um, we are constrained by Montana code right now. That is the limits that they allow us to impose as a municipal infraction. Um, I think the third question, and I'm not sure it even actually came up as a question, but it was something that we looked into, is what enforcement mechanism do we have from the Department of Revenue, which controls liquor licensing? As a city, we control business licensing, we do not control liquor licensing. Um, so it, the DORO does track complaints, and if a business is in violation of the city, um, ordinance, they can be fined, their, you know, business license can be revoked, it can be um, suspended, and again, the, they can find businesses up to $1,500. Um, again, that's not in our control, that is a report that we could make to the Department of Revenue if we found somebody had frequent violations. Um, so I, those were kind of the questions I looked at, happy to answer any, you know, questions council has or elaborate and I'll let Dana do her part of the staff report and maybe we can circle back. Great. Thank you, Angie. Um, one of the things that is important for everybody to know is that the governor's directives that are currently in place are not are not enforceable by the city. The enforcement lays, stays with the county health department and the county attorney. So at this point, we cannot enforce those directives. Um, but should the city council enact uh, restrictions either equal to or more restrictive than the state, then enforcement would fall to the city. I've reached out to the health department and they are, and, and I believe they've selected an individual that they're hiring as what they're calling the uh, COVID, COVID education liaison. Um, and this position will be to um, uh, look into all of the complaints filed by businesses or by individuals against businesses that are not following the directives, as well as individuals. The um, person will follow up on those complaints and help move that case through the enforcement process. It's still unclear to me if that enforcement will then be turned over to the county um, attorney or if it will actually go to the state for enforcement. Um, and so I'm still waiting to hear back on that information. Um, I did not hear back from Yellowstone County on whether they've been able to hire their position successfully, but as I mentioned, the Platte County did have an individual that did apply um, and is interested. So a challenging job to say the least for anybody who takes on that position. Um, the going rate right now is anywhere from 20, 27 to $30 an hour, um, and it's a temporary position. So if the city were to take on enforcement of the governor's directives and other measures in the interim, both myself and Michelle, um, we would step up as much as we could to help with that enforcement. But I think uh, long-term, if you're looking at this moving through uh, spring um, and, and even further, it might you know, be uh, necessary for us to hire a position to support um, our staff time since um, our time is limited. However, our mask ordinance um, that we had prior uh, did operate very similarly with a complaint-based process. And we were able to follow up with businesses, first with education, um, and then move forward with warnings, written warnings, um, and then move through the, the legal process with our prosecuting attorney. That being said, we did not get to that stage with any of our businesses all uh, did come into compliance after talking to them, um, and then our ordinance expired. Um, we have CARES funding available to the city, and that funding is on a reimbursement basis. So hiring of a position would be eligible um, if they are helping enforce these restrictions, and that is good through December 31st of 2020. Um, you know, pending the election tomorrow, I'm not sure how if Congress will address the 
the sunset date of that CARES funding. A lot of states and counties and cities throughout the country have not been able to utilize those funds. And this pandemic hasn't, the effects of it haven't ended and nor is the pandemic looking as if it will end in the near future. So I do foresee that action is going to be requested at the, the federal level, but I can't guarantee that that happens. So, you know, through December 31st, you could have some funding of a position. But after that, it would fall back to um, our local funds that we have. Um, we have looked into the resort tax uh, numbers for you somewhat. Um, obviously, uh, everything is down for the most part. Um, Finance Director Dahlman updated the quarterly report for you, um, which is a little bit different than our monthly report. You may be more used to seeing what this report shows is the amount collected by the business for that period and it has nothing to do with when the city collects it. Um, so it's, it's very important that what you're seeing is what is collected for that month by the businesses. Um, we've reviewed where different businesses have come in. We can't share specifics, but I can tell you that uh, facilities that have outdoor recreation equipment are doing great. Um, there are certain um, establishments, uh, both retail, uh, bars um, and restaurants, um, and lodging facilities that are doing okay. Um, and then there's some that are hurting quite a bit. Um, so it's not a one size fits all on, on how the um, restrictions are impacting each business. Um, we also, um, you know, provided information on the different types of grants that were available at the state. Um, there's only two currently open right now, the rest have closed. Um, but what I would encourage the council to do, um, and maybe this is encouragement either way, whether restrictions are considered or not, is that we reach out to the, to the governor and request that they assess how additional CARES funding dollars can go to our local businesses before December, should that date uh, be a hard date, because um, it's clear to me that there are some that still need that support um, if they are sustaining losses. And um, I think in general, that is a brief overview of what we've provided. There's probably some more detail in there, but Angie and I are happy to um, answer any questions you may have. If you do want some more information about what Missoula has enacted, I do have that available. Um, the Flathead County Health Department uh, denied the request of the health officer to limit gatherings to uh, no more than 500 indoors. And um, my understanding is that the letter uh, that was to be issued by the chair also uh, will be revisited at a later meeting because of significant changes um, needed to that letter. So that's an update that I have for you right now. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Angie. I'll start with and Councillor Fury. Any questions for Dana or Angie on their staff report? Uh, not at this time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Ben. No questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Councillor Sweeney. Dana, am I correct in my view of the um, recent numbers coming out of Flathead County that um, this thing is not slowing down, quite the opposite, it seems to be picking up pace. Is that an accurate assessment? That is. So um, it was interesting because between um, October 12th and October 18th, we were sitting at 63.6 per 100,000. Then we dropped down to what, uh, this is according to their website, 58.9. Um, and then this last week, the 26th through the 1st, uh, jumped up to 72.9 per 100,000. So um, I do not see that that the uh, the temporary dip in numbers is going to be a sustained long-term dip at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Rebecca, any questions? Dana, I just am wondering now that the health department has gone on to hire or hopefully hire someone that could do um, investigations and help with enforcement. Um, are you saying that in addition to that, we could have our own person hired through the CARES funding 
um, at least through the end of December to help with enforcement and education within the city limits. Yes, um, yes, and partially. So um, the health department, when they hire this person, will enforce the governor's directives within the city limits of Whitefish. But if the council puts in more restrictions than what is currently in place by the governor, we would have to do our own enforcement, and this would be a, a potential process to doing that. I do have concerns that us being, you know, for us to be able to actually hire the individual, onboard them with city policies, um, and of course it's during the holiday season with a temporary position may be a challenge. Um, but you know, there might be people that are looking for temporary work while, uh, there are closures. The, the job duty requirements, um, of the Yellowstone County position and the five County position, uh, which was mimicked after Yellowstone County does require some type of uh, law enforcement or legal background. So um, it's not, we're not just looking for any individual. We would need somebody with some type of uh, experience in those fields. And Dana, is our position, our normal enforcement officer position still vacant? I know that we've selected an applicant. Dave might be on here um, to let us know when that person will start. I do not know off the top of my head. Okay. So they, so they can, we can hire them to help with COVID and then transition them into another job as what I was wondering. Okay. Um, no, because yeah, we've already, I know we've offered the position for our current code enforcement officer position. Um, and, you know, as snow kicks up, I can tell you that that position gets very busy with snow complaints um, okay. and okay. other requirements. So I don't know that we would, and we're going to have a backlog already, um, being that we were, we had that position vacant for a while. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Rebecca. Brian, any questions this evening? Yeah, Dana, uh, do we have, uh, you know, a goal in mind for what we're, we're looking for in terms of kind of slowing the spread? I know we talked about it a little bit last week with the positivity rate. Um, do we, do we have anything in mind for that? Well, I, I can tell you that I'm not a health expert. Um, I'm an accountant, but I'm not a health expert, but I can tell you that the health department, what they are monitoring is the number of cases per 100,000. Um, the positivity rate, while um, is a recommendation from the World Health Organization, uh, 5% or less, well, less than 5%, I think is how it's worded. Um, the health department is looking for cases to be under the 50 per 100,000 per, for each week. Okay, per week. Um, and could you refresh my memory a little bit as to what um, Missoula did. I know I saw something in the paper, but I don't really remember. I think it was curbing alcohol sales at by 10 p.m. and they had they had some sort of number they were looking for a rolling weekly average to where they would kind of roll back these restri newer restrictions. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, they have a couple different um, parts to theirs. One is the um, they actually look at 25 cases per 100,000. Um, but they did roll back uh, to 50% capacity um, for all, my understanding, the way I've read it is for all businesses. Um, and then for bars um, and restaurants, brews, distilleries, um, they're going to be limited to eight people per table. Um, they have to have that six feet of separation and all bars shall close at 10 p.m. or earlier. And for any restaurant that also has a bar, the alcohol sales have to stop at 10 p.m. They did some more gathering restrictions. Um, they set it to 25 or less with no restrictions, you know, other than social distancing. And then they had kind of a, um, a tiered system for approval with uh, event planning um, for events to occur. But for their uh, release of the um, restrictions, they're looking at a seven day average of new case incident rate lower um, at 25 per 100,000 population for a period of at least two weeks. So lower than the 25 per 100,000 uh, for a period of two weeks. So because if you look at it week by week, you know, you could have a change in regulations pretty fast. And one of my concerns about that is the communication part with businesses. Um, but they are reviewing this every, um, they might be reviewing this every two weeks based on that. Um, they'll re-review this uh, health order on November 12th is what it states. In addition to the 
pop the incident case rates. Um, they're also looking at hospital capacity um, for both COVID and non-COVID patients. Um, they're also looking at the testing resources, turnaround time on testing, um, and then the timely isolation of positive cases, so contact tracing. Um, and so I think um, a lot of those health uh, indica or indicators, I guess, metrics are, are provided by the Flat Health Department on their website. Um, sometimes it, it comes down to how timely that information is. The, the data by area, so if we were just looking at whitefish, is really only updated once a week. And um, to me, it's not 100% clear on what they're reporting as of right now other than active cases. So, you know, if you were to look at the, the new case incident rate, um, and then hospital capacity, that's available on their website, though, on Platt County's website. Okay, what does our current hospital capacity look like? Do you know? I think we have 29 hospitalized to today. Um, you know, it, we're obviously in there, anything over 15, they're saying that we're in the red. Now, that being said, they are accepting patients from out of county. So last I had spoke with the hospital last week, I think 50% of their cases are from uh, counties outside of Flathead County, residents from outside of Flathead County, coming all the way from Butte and uh, the East, and then even, you know, closer as well, Lake County. Um, so I know that 29 is getting us to a close limit where North Valley is now accepting non-COVID patients. So what they do is they keep all the active COVID cases in Kalispell, and then they, they will um, move non-COVID patients that need care up to North Valley Hospital. And they face the challenges of not just the number of beds, but also staffing when they have their staff quarantine. So I know it's for them kind of up in the, it's not like just a bed count. It's also their staffing issues that can, can occur as well. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Dana. I, I don't have any other further questions right now. Thanks, Ryan and Steve. Uh, thanks, Dave, and I appreciate your report. Thanks for answering my questions. I really appreciate it. Um, I know you guys are busy. Um, just a question about Yellowstone County. They're hiring four of these, um, whatever the term is. Yep, <laughs> yep. Um, COVID education. education. I heard the education word in there somewhere. Uh, education liaison. <clears throat> uh, they're hiring four, correct? That is correct. And we're Flathead County's hiring one? As of right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, you know if there's any, I mean, Yellowstone County has a population of roughly 15,000 more people than us? You know yeah, I'm not sure. From... Or... Sorry about that. It's cut okay. now, but I, I'm not it's sure. Okay. I'm sorry. It's okay if you don't know. I don't know the answer to that is perfectly acceptable. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and then the stuff that's going on in Missoula, is that from the Missoula County Board of Health or is that from their city council? That is the Missoula City County Health Officer. Or okay, so it's not coming from their city council? Not their city council, no. It's the City County Health okay. Department. Okay. Uh, those are my only questions. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Anything else from the council before we open the public hearing? Uh, if I could, Mr. Mayor, I uh, had one question I forgot to ask. You bet, Ben. Uh, I was just wondering how things went over the weekend as it relates to the ordinance we passed last week. Um, was there any enforcement required or, or what happened? Yeah, so, you know, overall, um, I think that it went really well. I would say as expected, we had most of our businesses comply. In fact, um, my understanding is uh, most bars actually closed by 10 p.m. Chief Dial is on, and so I might have him just give you guys the full update since he was boots on the ground, at least on, on uh, Halloween. I was I did a, go to dinner on Friday and, and did uh, just kind of walk into a couple establishments, and um, overall the compliance was good. There, there might be one or two bad players that, you know, were – we'll be looking into, um, but Chief Dial, if you would like to kind of share your thoughts, um, I think we have to unmute you because you're muted. 
Michelle, I think his is the one that ends in zero one. Can yeah, I'm trying one? to unmute him. There he goes. Okay. I think we're trying at the same time. Oh. <laughs> mute, grab mute uh, fight hey, over here. <laughs> Can you hear me, John? Hello. Yep. Yep, you're yes. good. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, okay, uh, you know, the Friday and Saturday night were um, were pretty uneventful. Uh, surprisingly, there, there were a lot of trick or treaters out in the neighborhoods. Uh, probably, maybe sixty percent of what we usually have. Uh, we had no issues uh, at all. Um, you know, most people seem to be in their family groups, um, and there were a lot of places that uh, just had candy out at the end of the. Um, their uh, sidewalks. Uh, I did talk to a few people and you know they said they were aware of it and they were being as careful as they possibly could. And and then <clears throat> with that I think you know people are, are just looking for some sense of normalcy. Uh, as far as downtown, um, like Dana said, uh, most of the bars closed at 10. Uh, the only place that did stay open until 11:30 was a VFW. But we really had no issues there. Um, I have to give Dana credit. I'll, we'll call her uh, a special officer, Dana Smith. She did go into one establishment and take uh, video of uh, one establishment. We are going to forward that to the uh, uh, prosecutor for possible action. Um, and, but all in all, um, we had officers in and out of the bars continually uh, both nights. and. Um, I think the compliance was good. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, disappointed with what's going on, but, you know, understanding uh, the need for uh, doing what we're doing. So uh, the reception to our officers and them being in the in the bars uh, was very positive. Uh, the only thing was uh, uh, all the bars were texting each other, you know, the cops are on the way. So, you know, if there was, if there was something going on, um, you know, they corrected it before he got there, which is not a bad thing. At least they're correcting it. Um, I think one of the establishments uh, closed at six. Uh, that was the, the Remington. And uh, like I said, all in all, I was quite pleased with what, I, what went on. We did have uh, numerous DUIs, which you know, is pretty much the norm for uh, Halloween night. But uh, other than that, um, I, uh, I think people are taking this serious. That's all I have to report. Thanks, Chief Dow. I appreciate that. Dana, anyone else from staff you'd like to acknowledge before we open the public hearing? I think that's it. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Dana. We did advertise for what will be a public hearing on item 5A of our agenda, which is consideration and direction after holding a public comment period on COVID-19 community measures including consideration of reestablishing some of the guidelines in the state of Montana's phase one directive. I will repeat myself that we are not here this evening to legislate, but if there is the will of the council to provide some direction back to staff for a future meeting, uh, that, that will be the outcome this evening if the council elects to do so. With that said, um, I would ask those that are commenting this evening to please be respectful of the city's adopted rules of civil discourse. I would ask that you also limit your comments to three minutes as much as possible. And again, for the record, your name and address when you do speak. And I'll turn it back to Michelle now, who will acknowledge you individually for public comment. And thanks for attending tonight. Hey, thank you, John. So for those of you who would like to speak tonight, please go to the right of your screen if you're on the web. Under the participants list, find your name and uh, right click and raise hand or look for the icon um, and click the icon. And I will address you and unmute you at that when um, we go down the line. If you're on the phone, please uh, hit star three and that will also raise your hand. Also, that will lower your hand after you've spoken. So um, I know that we do have uh, two people so far that want to speak. I am going to unmute Dave from the Remington. And Dave, if you can unmute your phone, uh, you are, you have the floor. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. I know you guys got a tough job. Uh, 
going going backwards towards anything in phase one is going to disproportionately affect my business and the the other uh, restaurants and bars in town. And uh, I think the the musicians in town are getting it worse than me even. I mean, they haven't played since March, you know, so. Uh, I'd be all right with you guys staying where we're at. But I think that we should only look to further move in a forward direction. That number that uh, you guys uh, said, 72.9, that's 72.9 people infected per 100,000? Or per 1,000? Per 100, Dave. 72.9 patients per 100,000? Yes, sir. So, I mean, I feel the spike. I mean, it's obvious there's a lot more people that have it in town. But last week when I listened to the Tamily from the health department, it seemed like she had no correlation between uh, the staff from the bars and the restaurants uh, transmitting the disease to customers or vice versa. It seems to be spreading through our staffs and coming in the back door kind of and, and and that's what it seems like to me from the contact tracing we've done uh i closed early this friday and saturday uh out of a, an abundance of caution not so much for myself but more for the 42 people that i employ i uh I was supposed to have a, a hearing today with Governor Bullock's uh, people, and uh, it was pushed off, and I thought out of an abundance of caution I would close at 6 o'clock so as not to uh, have any other stuff against me going in, you know, going into the hearing. Uh, I probably lost about $10,000, and you guys lost your percentage of that. Uh, my, my staff lost more than anyone, you know, like I said, I'm not really here for myself tonight. I could probably live through, uh, anything you want to throw at me, but the people that I employ that are your constituents here in town, uh, I'm here to speak on their behalf. And I really believe that, uh, what you're attempting to, uh, to vote on here tonight uh, disproportionately affects our business over any other business in town. And I, I hope that you really consider what you're doing because, uh, you know, to, to force people out of business or to, or to force people out of work for 72.9 out of a hundred thousand seems, uh, you know, if you want to stay here where we're at, I'm all for it, like I said, but I'm not, I, I'm not a proponent of going backwards in any way. And uh, I'm only looking forward to phase three. And if you guys don't feel like we're ready for phase three, then I support you 100% at staying where we're at. But to go backwards in any way is going to affect me and my people and the rest of the restaurant business in town disproportionately and it's it's gonna I mean we've been taking it on the chin since the beginning and to continue to to force us under restrictions I think uh, it's it's making it very hard on everyone I think <clears throat> my, my suggestion would be to reach out to the to the community that is in the danger zone, that is compromised, and have them stay out of uh, places and give them guidelines to protect themselves. Like my mom, who lives in Columbia Falls, who's 80. And uh, and that's, that's all I have to say. I'm starting to ramble. Thanks very much for your comments, Dave.
Thanks for having me. You bet. Okay, the next person um, is on the phone and you have the last two digits of 3-1. I will unmute you. And so you'll need to unmute yourself. And then you have the four. Phone number that ends in 3-1. You're now unmuted. The phone number that ends in the last two digits of 3-1, you're unmuted. Can you hear us? You. You'll need to unmute your phone. Can you hear? Uh, hey guys, can you hear me? There you go. Yep, we. You're. Uh, you've got the floor. All right, that was a battle. I'm sorry. My name is uh, Sam Booker of the 275 Diamond Court. Um, I would just like to say, without any relief for the employees of bars, restaurants, from bartenders and servers to cooks, hosts, um, bouncers, dishwashers, everybody involved in an already slow time in this town to cut back on any money they could possibly make seems extremely unfair. Um, there's no real option for them to pick up that lost wages right now. And I would also like to say that, you know, anybody who drove by the Blue Moon or the Midway Tavern or anything outside of city limits on Halloween, they were packed. If we shut down, the people who want to go out are just going to do it in Kalispell, in Columbia Falls. You know, it, it's, it doesn't seem to me that it's really going to slow anything down except for our local businesses. I would also like to say if you do roll it back, maybe consider putting the burden on city employees to enforce these rules instead of the businesses, instead of having 17 year old hostess get screamed at by customers who don't want to wear masks and then the business possibly getting fined, maybe put it on the public to wear their mask and they get the fine. And that's really all I have to say and I appreciate you guys listening to us and um, I hope we can move forward in a positive direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Okay, Betsy Constan, you are next. You have the floor. Hi, everybody. It's Betsy Constan, 573 Summers Avenue. And I'm currently serving on the school board. You heard me last week, too, so I won't really say much else except just to remind you that we're in hybrid situation in the schools, desperately trying to keep kids in school as much as possible. And one of the things we're really considering at our next school board meeting next week is how could we open um, schools 100% of the time for say K2 children who are most at risk um, of missing a lot of their education this year. Um, and the only way we can do that is if the cases uh, continue to go down because uh, we're just on the edge of having enough staff to be able to run the schools at the moment and uh, every day is kind of a, a challenge. So um, I just think now's a really good time to kind of nip this in the bud. November's a quiet month in this town anyways. And if we could put in a few more regulations to help uh, keep it down in town that might help us before ski season gets rolling and Christmas time and all that. So those are just some thoughts and I uh, really recommend that we uh, do everything we can to to keep the schools going and keep children able to learn this year. So thank you very much. Thanks Betsy, appreciate your comments. Hey, Randy Larson, you should be able to unmute your, and you're on the floor. 
Good evening, guys. Um, I'm a little uh, upset about about the uh, this discussion and the enforcement whatsoever. I, I want to make sure that uh, you understand that I believe this is not uh, something that we should be doing. I know that you uh, can come up with multiple statistics and make the make it work for the narrative that you want it to work in. Uh, but I've been uh, researching and keeping an eye on the statistics through the CDC regularly for the last several months. <clears throat> um, I know that you as a group uh, have stated that you care about the health of this community. So I'd like to offer some of the uh, statistics that the CDC is claiming. Um, some of these uh, numbers are, are uh, some of the numbers that I'm going to give you here are numbers from 2018, but most of them are from 2020, and I'll, I'll dissect it as much as possible. In 2018, Montana heart disease deaths uh, came at a number of 2,347 for the year. In 2020, Montana had all cancer-related cancers, uh, had a total case number of 5,850, with a total death count of 2,140 Montana souls. The mortality rate uh, would have put that at 36.6%. If you extrapolate lung cancer from that number, there were a total of 770 cases. Uh, the uh, death toll was 480 Montana souls, which put that at a mortality rate of 59%. In other words, Anyone who had lung cancer uh, in, that, in this year, this year uh, 59 percent were going to die. In 2018, Montana accidents claimed 598 uh, Montana souls. Uh, again, in 2018, um, suicide claimed 265 Montana souls. So now, in 2020, Montana COVID-19 cases are at 34. 252, 34,252, and this is according to the CDC, with a total death count of 386 Montana souls. The infection mortality rate is 1.12. So of the people that have gotten COVID in Montana, only 1% died. Almost 100% of the people that get COVID live. We are, uh, the, the council seems to be living under fear. The science and the statistics do not support your necessity to impose these restrictions and enforcements on the businesses in town. If we are going to go by the COVID logic of enforcement that you're proposing, then what we really should be doing is enforcing a ban on smoking. We should be banning people from eating at Sweet Peaks or deep fried foods at their other restaurants. We should be banning cars and skiing and hiking and climbing and, and we should pass a helmet mandate. But everybody knows that that's ridiculous and that we're not gonna hire a smoking liaison or a heart disease liaison. This is absolutely absurd uh, and the restrictions are absurd. The reason I say that it's absurd because <clears throat> in Montana, as I mentioned, the number one cause of death is heart disease and the highest cause of death from heart disease is smoking. Yet you counselors encourage smoking by providing ashtrays throughout the entire city. This is hypocrisy at the greatest level and so I would stop trying to tell us that you care about the health of this community. The enforcement arm that you're trying to impose here is an overreach of government and is a disgrace to the people who are working hard to make a living for themselves and to bring in the taxes that allow the city to run. If these restrictions continue, if you continue to pose these instructions, people are not going to want to come to Whitefish. And we have heard many, many people 
who have stated the, that very same thing, that they would rather go somewhere else, just like the gentleman that was talking earlier. Uh, the blue, uh, blue Moon was packed. Um, Kalispell was packed. Columbia Falls was packed. And these restrictions that you're imposing, I do not understand what your agenda is here. But uh, if you are trying to be the face of the city by enforcing these absurd restrictions, you are going to create this town into a ghost town and nobody likes ghost towns. And your the death of Whitefish will be your legacy. Thank you. Randy. I would like I would I would like to know you're, you're pushing about five minutes now out of respect for the 30 other people who would like to comment. I ask that you please wrap up. I would like to know from Angie and Chief Dial what the constitutional um, uh, what the constitutional uh, basis are on these restrictions when you when you're inconsistent with the other uh, with the numbers that we have of deaths in different kinds. You guys are putting ashtrays and different things out there. How are you guys, how is that different in COVID? Thanks for your comments, Randy. This is an opportunity for, for question and answer here. I wanna make something very clear to those that are participating this evening with the consistent um, comments that these are quote, our restrictions, meaning the city's restrictions. There's been three instances where city restrictions have exceeded what we're currently under, which is a state directive. And that was number one, when we imposed a, a lodging ordinance back in the spring regarding uh, lodging facilities, accepting long-term reservations, number one. Number two, our mask ordinance that was adopted and implemented, it came into effect 20, a mere 24 hours before the governor's directive came in that went statewide 24 hours later. And then thirdly, the two nights that we imposed additional restrictions for Halloween. So the reference that these are quote, our restrictions or the city's restrictions is an inaccurate comment and statement. These are state directives that are coming down statewide, statewide mandates. With if that said, state, Michelle, I'll take the next speaker, please. If they're statewide, they don't need to be enforced by the city. Okay, um, is anybody else would like to speak? Please raise your hand, star three if you're on the phone or hover over. Okay, Sandra, let me look for you here. Okay, Sandra, you are unmuted. Hold on, you're still muted, Sandra. Can you unmute? Can you click? Oh, there you go. There you go. should be unmuted yeah, now. It took a couple of taps. I'm sorry. My name is Sandra Guzman. I own a um, retail shop downtown on Spokane Avenue. I, I'm just calling um, because I'm a little upset uh, with the new restrictions. Um, I listened to the meeting uh, last week that you folks had um, very carefully. Uh, we've been kind of struggling pretty bad. Uh, we support the, the music community here in town, traveling musicians as well. Um, our sales have just tumbled. Um, I want to say that 98% of the people that do come into my shop are masked. They come in, I have a, a station where you can sanitize your hands and I offer masks if they want one. I don't um, push it on people um, to wear one. Um, I've been in other shops in town. I find it very off-putting with the signs all over the windows and people coming from other places. It's very um, unwelcoming. That being said, I understand the situation um, with COVID. I have my own opinions about it. I'm diabetic. I've worn the mask. Um, I have several different masks and I can't seem to breathe with it on. I get very faint. I wear my medical alert bracelet. It doesn't seem to matter in some establishments when I explain why I don't wear a mask and ask to leave the store and wait on the sidewalk. Um, that bothers me a whole lot, but I understand I'm respectful because 
I've been here in this town for over 13 years and I've supported everybody, uh, most of the shops um, for my lunch and breakfast and gifts and stuff. And I will respect everybody's um, wishes not to come into their establishment. If this restrictions come down any harder and you're putting the onus on the business people, I don't think it's, it's right. I think you ought to um, somehow, and I, I'm trying to make an offer of, of some kind of option where, because this could be a temporary thing. If you had um, those, um, what do they call them? Uh, when you drive into a town, they have the, the bill, the sign out there telling you, oh, we have this highway closed or this street is closed. If we had some sort of public notice before you enter the town to let people know what the, you know, we're serious about COVID, we're serious about um, masking and protecting our community, please follow in suit. That would be better. There's people who don't know what the rules are, don't know what the ordinance are. They change so different from town to town. Um, I've been following um, Governor Bullock intensely, uh, his posts on Facebook. I've called his office to confirm information about um, expiration of this COVID mandate. Um, according to this, the state, it's only supposed to last 120 days and then it expires with that extension and with that addition too, unless it passes through legislation. From what I understand the interview he put with the newspaper, he's not going to be extending or adding to, he's leaving it up to the counties. Now the following day, the county, Flathead County said they're not going to impose restrictions or um, enforcements or, or extend this either. So it's falling, I think, on the city of Whitefish to make that discernment whether you're going to do that for the people here. And I think um, I feel a lot of pressure um, and the talking to other business people, not from the bars. I mean, there's other retail shops uh, services in the community. It's not all about the bars and the restaurants. You know, folks like me are kind of having a tough time and this is really going to make it a little bit worse. Um, you have to deal with your landlords and all that other nonsense. So I really would think that um, I'm asking the council to take that into consideration because a lot of people aren't going to make this next round. Uh, we have the COVID, we have shoulder season now we're dealing with and now hopefully tomorrow after the elections a little pressure will be relieved so um on that i'm just asking that maybe you do something to take the pressure off the retail and off the business community and put it on the community itself by putting some type of other notices that they can grasp or read or see because not everybody's tuning into this and not everybody picks up the newspaper and not everybody tries to um, pull up posts from the governor like I do. So um, I could appreciate you um, considering that fact. And I'm, I'm opposed to any more heavy restrictions. I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra, for your comments tonight. Just for uh, the record again, uh, for the speakers tonight, just your name and address for the record. Okay, um, phone number that ends in 6-6, six, six. you can unmute and you have the floor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, very good, hi, I'm Dave Von Kleist, I'm at 106 Mill Avenue. And uh, I'm sure uh, you, some of you may recall, I was uh, at the council meetings the past couple months ago, and I presented to you uh, copies of Congressional Records Center reports and JAM articles, uh, basically illustrating that, uh, that the government is not necessarily looking out for the health of its population. Um, this has been standard operating procedure for many decades, and if the government re government really cared about the the public health, they would have gone after Monsanto, Dow Chemical, and Union Carbide, etc., many many years ago. Um, I've been watching this, 
and you're probably aware that I've been watching this very carefully for several months now. And uh, I, I'm just amazed at how many times the CDC has had to revise its numbers. And if they don't, that those numbers don't coincide with whatever agenda that uh, is on the plate, uh, those numbers are ignored. As an example, three weeks ago, the CDC revised their numbers. They had to differentiate between deaths from COVID versus deaths with COVID. And that was illustrated here in the city of Whitefish last summer. Uh, Steve Spear, unfortunately, was assaulted behind the VFW. And as a result of his injuries, he passed away to, uh, three days later. When he was in the hospital, they tested him and he tested positive for COVID. As a result, his own mother couldn't visit with him and see him off into the next world. Now, this is going on. I'm just using that as an example. Um, the CDC basically had to lower their death rate by almost 95, I think it was 96 percent. At the time, they were claiming that it was over 200,000 deaths from COVID. But when you separate the deaths with COVID versus the deaths from COVID, the actual deaths from COVID-19 were actually less than 10,000. So the point is that the, the numbers are bouncing around. Um, there are several other issues here. The PCR tests that have been utilized, physicians, not, all, not just all over the country, but all over the world, are screaming from the rooftops. In fact, there was, last week there was a coalition of 7,000 physicians that gathered together to scream bloody murder that this entire uh, manipulation of numbers is creating a global pandemic that doesn't exist. Um, the, the false positives are somewhere between 80 and 90 percent. Um, that, that's just one issue. The other issue is that these paper masks that everybody seems to be wearing, they're treated with what's with a, a chemical called PTFE, which is a known carcinogen. And so the masks are causing more of a problem than they're solving. On top of that, Many people that are, uh, that, that are reporting with uh, or showing up with bacterial pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia is up 70% now, and that is being attributed to the constant wearing of masks. Some people have to wear them for eight hours a day. If they take them off, they lose their job. So the point is, is that we are dealing with numbers and figures that are being skewed and manipulated. Now, you can say, okay, well, you got that from the Internet, and so we're going to dispel all of that. Well, I would ask you to do your own diligence that I have done. I have gone directly to the websites. I've gone directly to the uh, medical journals. I've gone directly to the CDC, and that's where I get my numbers from. So I'm asking you, please use good science, not the science that's being pushed off by the, by the WHO, which obviously has an agenda. And yes, Anthony Fauci has flip-flopped many times. He was on 60 Minutes this past spring saying that the masks are non-effective. Um, and what's happening here is that the restrictions being imp imposed upon the city of Whitefish and indeed Flathead County and all of, all of Montana are based upon science that has an agenda behind it. And there are people who just, you know, if, they, if whatever facts are presented to them don't resonate with what they currently believe, they just dispel the facts and they dispel the messenger as a conspiracy theorist. Well, so be it. But the point is, is that if you're wrong, and you very well could be, I believe you are, when you're making these decisions based on, you know, re, uh, for restrictions based upon the numbers that you're being provided, if you are wrong, you are participating in a, an egregious betrayal of public trust. And the people who are suffering the most are the ones that are doing the best that they can to comply with those restrictions. Now, another a simple fact is that the, the children uh, that are being forced to have these masks put on, many of them are coming down with rashes around the face because of the bacteria that settles in. Now, these are all facts. This is all real stuff. Now, if you want to ignore it, you do so at your own peril. But many, many people, not just here in Whitefish and not just in the Flathead and not just in Montana, but all over the country are waking up and understanding that there is seriously an agenda of, at, afoot here. And we are all being played, and that includes you. So I beg you, please, before you, uh, you enforce any more restrictions or continue to carry on with the restrictions already imposed, I would ask that you look seriously at all the doctors, physicians, healthcare workers, and again, their numbers are not just in the thousands, but in tens of thousands, whose voices are being stifled and censored by 
YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Google, you name it. As a matter of fact, they had a congressional hearing last week on that exact subject, censorship. So I ask that you go beyond the, the numbers and the information that's being presented to you on a silver platter, look outside and use your heads because the decisions you make right now are affecting every single person in this community. And some of these, the, some of these decisions are not in the best interest of the people of this community. So with all due respect, I ask that you reconsider what you're, what you're discussing and do so in, 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 uh, in, in good faith, with good science, and with your constituency uh, in mind, rather than any political party or whatever it might, whatever I might be influencing you one way or the other. I thank you for your time, and please know that there are a lot of, a lot of us who are watching you very carefully. Have a good evening. Thank you, David. Michelle. Okay, so um, phone number that ends in four nine. Four nine, you can unmute and you have the floor. Four nine. Can you unmute? Uh, we'll move on. We'll come back to that phone number with the ending number of four nine, and we'll move on to. Uh, what shows up to be MC. You should be unmuted and you have the floor. Hi, my name is Megan Chason and I live at 704 Cedar Street here in Whitefish, Montana. Um, I've written to you folks a number of times and want to thank you for all the time and effort and energy that you guys are putting into um, listening to public comment and going through all the research and finding out what's being done. Um, I work as a science teacher and I, I realize that science is a difficult subject to correctly analyze data um, without a bias. What I wanted to spend my time on with comments tonight, since we're limited to three minutes, is um, what I thought was interesting that Angela said earlier about being a charter city where we do have some powers that the opportunity does exist for us to um, set mandates, if I heard her correctly. Um, that precedent has been set by other counties such as Yellowstone. And I really feel very, very strongly that it's time for us to act. I am getting so frustrated at hearing it's not my job from so many people at so many levels of government. Apparently it's nobody's job, but it has to be somebody's job to help protect public safety. And so I implore you folks who I live here in the community with, and I feel like I can speak more freely with to um, step up as leaders of our community to do what we can to help protect the health and safety of our community members. Um, I really feel like the shoulder season that we're entering right now is sort of this natural lull in our community. And it seems that this is an ideal time for us to put in big drastic measures to go to even full closure again. Um, but to really knock cases back down to zero. When we were under the stay at home order in the spring, cases were at zero uh, or went back down to zero, I should say. And so that worked. We, we know how cause and effect works and, and we know that we can knock those cases back down. We are much higher right now and it's gonna be harder to knock cases down, but the shoulder season represents our best opportunity to do that with the least um, disruption to economic, which I realize is a major concern for a lot of folks here in, in town. Um, and then I wanna also, um, say two things quickly. One about the complaint-based system. Um, just to, when we get into nuts and bolts of details, I know that's not necessarily what's going on tonight, 
but um, the complaint-based system seems like a strange way to go about enforcement. If I'm concerned for my health and I'm choosing to stay home, I'm not at the Remington or the VFW or other establishments where hearsay, I've heard folks aren't wearing masks there, but I don't know that firsthand because I haven't been there and I'm not going to put in a complaint form about something that's via hearsay. So I think more um, just random walkthroughs would be essential. So whether that means um, hiring an additional position or adding it to someone's duties at the city, um, thinking about how to actually enforce it, um, a complaint complaint-based system really um, doesn't necessarily seem like the most effective way in my personal opinion. Um, creativity and data. When we get back into thinking about reopening, we've got to think creatively about how we can get um, revenue and income to businesses and support our local businesses that of course we want to support, um, but also look at a data-driven reopening, um, not something that's got a time stamp on it, but something that's driven by positivity rates and something that's driven by cases per 100,000. So again, I implore you folks to act and to act strongly and swiftly during the shoulder season. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thanks, Megan. Okay, for those of you who have already spoken, please, if you could lower your hand, either by hitting the star three again or just clicking on your hand, uh, that will be helpful for those that are coming in. Um, so for, now oh, everybody's moving. Alex Metzels, you are unmuted. You have the floor if you can unmute yourself. Yep. Hey there. Can you hear me? Can yes, thank you. Hey, um, so uh, thanks for your time. Alex Metzold, uh, 1338 uh, 4th Street, Whitefish, Montana. Um, local resident, but also business owner with the Buffalo Cafe in Whitefish. Uh, wanted to chime in. Um, first, thank you guys for what you've done. The, the, the general counsel for kind of giving us a chance to say this. Um, I'll get in quick and try and get out because clearly you guys have a lot on your plate. Uh, here to chime in on behalf of myself and again, like Dave, our employees, we have about 40 employees. Um, we have been doing everything we can to stay by the book and to uh, look out for them and the community. And in doing so, it is, it's tough, it's doable. Um, I will say that I, I don't think we should roll forward on anything but I don't think rolling back into a 50% capacity or something below, I, I do think we're at a pretty good sweet spot, if you can call it that, um, with 75%, the distancing, the mass, the things that are going on, I think they're, they're really doable. I think it's, it's worth sticking to them. To go back would be, it would be super difficult. It would be difficult for us as business owners. It would be really difficult for our employees and it is the slow season and it's easy to say that sure let's do this now in the slow season but in the slow season 50 percent means that you know on a lunch rush at the buffalo cafe at noon we can't see a banker who's on his lunch or a couple kids who came from lunch break or anything it looks different than just saying it um 50 it it cuts back it says hey i'm sorry we can have a table but it's 30 minutes from now on a tuesday at noon you know, it's just not realistic. It, it, it makes it difficult. So I say that 75% um, it's doable, done right. It, 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 I really do feel that we can balance public health and economic health on this. Um, and I think that it, we are in a good spot with 75, uh, rolling backwards, super tough. Um, and for what it's worth, uh, some of our, our other commenters have been about our employees uh, who we're dealing with. Messaging would help. Um, if we're doing these things, messaging, communicating, helping get the word out. I'm lucky. I'm a person who's at my business's door regularly. Um, if it's not me, sometimes it is an 18 year old high school kid who is left being the gatekeeper to some really tough rules that we have to implement. And it sucks. It sucks for me and I'm strong with it. It really sucks to say to our girl who's at the door that day, hey, 
stick by this and watch what comes in. Um, so if you can help with the messaging, if we can help communicate between um, the chamber, the heart of Whitefish, explore Whitefish, the city, hotels and restaurants is what to expect when you're dining out or going out or shopping out in Whitefish, it would go a long way in at least diffusing some of the battles we're having at our door, trying to implement these things that you guys are having us do that, that we're into, we're, we want to stick with them. We like being in, and I will, I will leave it at that. Um, last thing I will say is I just like being a part of this business community. It's, it's been nice being in a business community that sticks together and for better or worse, has these conversations as a group with everybody involved. So I, I like that we're in on it together. I think we can find a solution together. I think the better that we're all able to stick together uh, as a Whitefish downtown business community, the easier it will be on all of us. Like Sandra, the lady who spoke earlier said, it, it's really hard when there's mixed messaging, clear messaging will help. And, uh, and yeah, so thank you very much. Appreciate your input or letting us give our input and, um, that's where we stand. Thanks, Alex. Your comments. Okay, Amy Sharp, um, you can unmute yourself and you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much. I wasn't planning on speaking. Um, I'm a registered nurse at North Valley Hospital in the special care unit. I was hopeful, I was just planning on listening because my daughter was listening. Um, I was hopeful that someone from the hospital administration might be on, but I don't see any names. Um, I did want to clarify, um, we will be taking COVID positive patients starting tomorrow. My manager is Judy Smith. She is also the manager of the ER and Cal Spell is no longer able to handle the numbers. So we will be taking COVID positive patients starting tomorrow. Um, I see it from a different view. I respect the opinions and the businesses and I love this town and I respect the difference, you know, the, the questioning of the numbers and I'm confused as well. But what I see is the fact that we, with Kalispell no longer being able to take the patients, we have to take the patients. That leads to a lack of beds that leads to canceled surgeries. It also leads to delayed outpatient imaging. Um, and it leads to people staying at home and staying sicker longer. Um, the gentleman that spoke earlier of the numbers of heart attacks and, and lung disease and cancer, those patients fortunately don't come, all, come to the hospital at once. Um, COVID-19 patients are coming to the hospital all at once. Um, that is the danger of this disease. Um, another thing I wanted to say is I respect the fact that the restaurants are enforcing the mass and I think that's wonderful. Unfortunately, once they are inside the door, they are taking them off to eat. Um, nurses, we are no longer to eat, able to eat in our break rooms. We are no longer able to eat at the nurse's station. Um, we can take our mask off for a brief second to take a drink of water. There is a high this is a very tricky, dangerous disease, unlike the flu. And secondly, we're entering flu season. So the combination of influenza with the COVID-19 is very scary for healthcare professionals. Um, we've never dealt with anything like this before. So it, it is going to be very challenging having influenza patients flooding our, our hospitals and COVID-19 patients flooding our hospitals. Um, I implore you to act and act swiftly for the sake of Kalispell Regional Hospital in North Valley. And I appreciate you, um, I appreciate you hearing my voice. Oh, John, you're muted. Once again, thanks for your comments, Amy. Thank you. Very much. Okay, uh, phone number with the end uh, ending in two six. You, um, your mic is unmuted, and you can speak. Okay. Oh. Okay. 
Um, is there anybody else that would like to speak? You can raise your hand on the web by clicking on your name, or you can do star three by the phone on your keypad. Okay, I see um, a phone number by the end of ending in four nine. You can unmute your mic and speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So this is Kevin Proctor at 336 Fairway Drive. And um, I just, I had actually a couple comments, questions, and I did want to reiterate, you know, some of the comments that were said before, because I think, you know, there was some valuable um, information that was said. And um, I, I, I wanted to start just with kind of data driven and, um, I've been following Flathead and CDC, but um, I just think it's important that we, you know, as much as we can get a handle on what the data is saying for the whitefish area in terms of, you know, how the spread um, is happening. And so I don't know, you know, if somebody can comment on that. Is it small gatherings? Is it large gatherings? Is it the bars, et cetera? But I think that that's important that we get a good handle. Um, because it leads, obviously, the solution, you know, would be uh, based on what the, you know, um, as much as we can find out about, you know, how the how the spread is occurring. Um, so I, I think that's my, my just a comment. And if anybody has anything to say about that, that would be great. But it leads into my second kind of question or comment because I think that um, uh, there was mention of of some restriction of 500 people in a gathering and that just seems really high to me, um, uh, particularly when we know that it is, you know, that COVID spread so easily among groups. And um, so I was just kind of curious of how, you know, how we came up with the 500 number, but because that seems awful high to me. Um, and then my, I guess my third comment is, um, if we don't have a lot of information um, about how COVID is spreading and its community spread. Um, I, I did find out that um, uh, the state um, was able to purchase the um, Abbott uh, by now um, rapid testers. And um, to me, that would be kind of an excellent way for us to get a much better handle on the spread. And, and you know, we would really, I think if we had access to that, um, rapid tester, and, and I understand it comes with some limitations, it's not quite as accurate, but the ability to be able to um, test uh, a large amount of people in a, in a very short amount of time and, and really get a handle on, you know, how this is spreading. And then people now know, you know, if you have it or if you don't have it quickly, um, uh, you know, they can be put in quarantine, contact trace, et cetera. So it seems to me that that, that might be a kind of an innovative solution if we were able to um, implement it. So kind of that, that, that's, that's my comments, but I do, I do like the idea of data driven. Let's, let's get to the data. I like the idea of education. I think I put a couple comments about more information on the website would be great, but um, th that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments tonight. Okay, anybody else like to speak? You can raise your hand by right clicking by your name on the participants list or star three on your phone. I, nobody, I don't see anybody else, John. Okay, thanks very much, Michelle. Not seeing any other folks willing to provide testimony on this item, I will go ahead and close the public hearing and turn it back to the council for discussion. I'm gonna to try to keep this fairly orderly so we don't go down a rabbit hole quickly, uh, which you could tend to do with a topic of this nature. So with that said, I'm gonna start at the top and just ask each counselor if they have any comments uh, related to the public comment. 
plant this evening or any direction they would like the council to consider this evening, which would be a direction back to staff. And I'll start with Councillor Fury, if you don't mind, Andy. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know that I have a lot of comments. I have a lot of thoughts and I have a lot of uncertainties like I think all of us do and I wish that I didn't have uncertainties because I'd like to be able to say yeah this is exactly what we need to do and unfortunately I don't find myself in a position of being well informed enough to do that um, I can certainly look at what's going on out in the world and understand that we need to do something but I also have to be very cognizant of the fact that we don't live in a bubble here in Whitefish and we're looking at community spread and community spread happens amongst our county it doesn't happen just amongst whitefish feet people and i know myself by example go to costco once a week um i'm down in kalispell and i'm around a lot of people with masks that aren't on not at costco actually costco is really good about it but i'm concerned that by us going to additional restrictions here in our community we don't serve anyone's interest in doing that i understand the symbolic nature of doing that but at the same time i've never felt that this is a position that i put myself in to just do things that are symbolic i like to do things that affect actual real positive change and i'm afraid that us going to additional restrictions is not going to make any difference in terms of what's going on in this valley in terms of spread i think that has to come from a county level and i think it has to come from a state level and i don't buy into any of the people that are going to tell me that it's not a real thing i have to listen to amy sharp and all of my other friends that work in the healthcare industry and you know what it's a huge problem but whitefish alone is not going to solve that problem what i would like i think from my own personal perspective i thought alex had a lot of good comments and i live in a house where a business that's being closed for the winter that's a food and beverage business and it's being closed because of what's going on and it's not because people are doing the right thing it's because people are doing the wrong thing and i think that's the problem and i think all of us as businesses that you know are out there that are frontline that do serve the public are just going to have to come together and like alex said and i think we're going to have to do it together to make it work and so i mean i guess what i would support from us as a council is staying with what the current state regulations are at this point with the 75 percent i think what we did for halloween was good i wouldn't necessarily look at a change in timing um i think we could leave time where it's at but what i would like to see us do is go back and this would be probably a change from the um, current state directive is no congregation at bars. I'd like to see table service. I think that would help. I think social distancing. And I think if we do those things and if we do that by city ordinance, then we do have some city enforcement as opposed to waiting for somebody else to come in and do it. I don't support hiring somebody for the next 60 days to try and come in and fix the problem for us. I don't see that as being a, a functional solution for us. Um, one, by the time we got somebody hired, the money's going to run out and then what are we going to do about it? I don't, if we find out that there's going to be funding available for a longer period of time, I think we've heard from a number of our business owners that better messaging, better information and all of those kind of things would help. And I think if we could fund a position to help with that, that would be a good thing for us. Another nap, I'll go ahead and shut up. I don't really have much else to say. Um, and that's kind of my, my thoughts. Thanks, Andy. Uh, ben. So I, I continue to find this front, this entire situation to be very regrettable, um, extremely frustrating. And, you know, here we are. And yet again, this morning, the county once again has punted the problem. Um, you know, having heard all of this testimony this week and last week, uh, which I think has really helped me formulate my own views, um, I do feel like the situation we have right now is untenable and unacceptable. I mean, I, it just seems like we, we had our business had our first COVID positive employee this weekend. Um, it, it just seems like things are out of control. Um, and I, I think on balance, I'm to the point where I do feel like we as a city council should be 
taking some leadership here where nobody else seems to want to do so. And I know it's difficult and it means that we have to, you know, have a lot of these hearings and a lot of, of differing opinions on the topic. But I think in general, I feel some sort of action here is appropriate. And it would be some sort of action with the hope that um, the county or the state um, would in turn step up um, because I do think those those groups are better suited for this than we are. So with that said, I think the conversation in my mind may be turning to specifics. And I think the specifics are really, really important because I don't, you know, we have a lot of wonderful business owners here. I do not think what we're trying to do here is to handicap them or ruin their businesses or anything like that. I think there's a happy medium here. And I would just say that it seems like a lot of the the conversation tends to focus on capacity. Like I know last week we we talked 75 or 50 percent capacity quite a bit. And in a lot of ways, I almost think that that's the wrong conversation to some degree. Like a business that is at 75 percent capacity that follows the six foot distancing requirements and everything else and, and doing things the right way is in my mind safer than a business at 50% capacity and you know there's just no following the rules. And so I, I think for me there's it's important that what we're discussing isn't really about capacity. It's about one thing it's about is enforcement. There is absolutely zero enforcement. And I, I don't mean enforcement by having um, you know writing you know citations to everybody all the time. I think about what what Chief Dial described they did this weekend, which is occasionally go through and walk through and you know make sure things are on the up and up would probably help quite a bit with the straggler folks who, who don't seem to want to help here. Um, and all the, the vast majority of businesses that are already doing the right thing, I think, you know, mind a bit. Um, the other thing is, is events, because I, I do believe that events, um, you know, they they are a major contributor to this problem. And I think event restrictions are an important piece of this, even though, you know, it, the conversation seems to be focused on bars and restaurants. So I think those two things, enforcement and events, um, are a key part to me, I think, of what we would be doing here. Um, I would be interested in a comparison of any other aspects from um, phase one was to what we might be considering. Um, I know like gyms and stuff like seem to have come up in that conversation, but, um, mm -hmm. but anyway, I, I'm sorry I rambled here, but I, I do, I do think in my mind it is time to talk some specifics. I think it might look something like what we had last week on a more permanent basis. And, um, and I hope everybody can uh, stay healthy and we can help everybody get through this. And that means the employees of the bars and restaurants, businesses themselves and the health of our community. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate your comments. Councillor Sweeney. Thank you, John. Um, a couple of things that are kind of guiding me in thinking through this are that we really, I really am, and I think we all really are, about trying to do what we can, not just to protect the community as a whole, but in particular our businesses, as well as our schools. Um, and to make sure that they're able to make a living, employ the people that they want, um, and to be what Whitefish is. I mean, they contribute to this society and this group of, uh, this group of businesses does that. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is that the reason I think we need to think about what is going to be most effective is we continue to know that the Canadian border is closed. The likelihood of it opening if we don't get a hold on this thing and bring our numbers down um, as a state, as a community anyway, um, the likelihood that we'll get any of our Canadian uh, visitors back is like zero and it'll be a long time coming. And that is having a huge impact, we know, on a day-to-day -day basis on all of our businesses. Um, and it goes to the, the businesses down in Kalispell as well, I might add. So I think we probably ought to be thinking about doing something 
I am not interested in going backwards as people have thought about in terms of creating more restrictive uh, limitations on capacities or business operations that are currently um, currently issued by the state. I think those are good. I think most of the businesses have been able to um, operate and operate uh, fairly well. Um, nobody's great. Nobody's making a ton of money and it hurts. I get it. Um, but it's something I think we can live with. The thing that dis disturbs me more than anything else is that those that are choosing not to wear masks, be it their God-given right or something else, that's fine. But understand your failure to follow that one simple rule or ask of you is driving the businesses crazy. It makes their jobs more difficult, more miserable, and it shows absolute disrespect for them and their employees. And I find that unacceptable. Um, if we would simply do the social distancing, people wear masks when they're not eating or drinking. And we, uh, pick, if we have to pick a number, we maximize our capacities to 75%, I could live with that. What I think our acting uh, as a city would do was again, give us the opportunity to, for lack of it, follow up and enforce and let know that people are looking at them every day, which is gonna encourage them to do the right thing. Um, so I'm in, I am interested and I'm open to some local ordinance that would give us uh, um, some tools to um, act where the county will not. Um, and I think that that would be of some service uh, to the community and to the businesses for that matter. Um, the purpose of what I would propose or would be willing to do would be prevent someone from spreading the virus or disease to others, either in the same business on a peer to peer basis from staff to a customer or from the customers back to the staff. That's the goal here. And the reason we're picking on businesses or downtown or whatever you think about it, it's because where people gather and we do know that this thing spreads like crazy when you have gatherings. We know that. So, and the idea of 500 to one of our commenters earlier, please know that was not the city of Whitefish that was considering such a ridiculous thing. That was the county and why that was even, why that was even proposed or who would care is absolutely ridiculous to consider. That being said, we know that we have businesses in this town where their employees have been infected through their own fault, out through not watching what they were doing. And I think they have to take responsibility for that. And they have to understand that their failure to follow the simple rules is causing their employer all kinds of grief. It's ending their employment for a short period of time in any case. They can't make any money. This is not any good for anybody. Um, I would be interested in having further discussions with all of us to talk about what would be most effective um, or how we could be most effective. Um, we can argue about whether additional ordinances would be helpful. I think they might be if they re reinforce what our current state level con concerns and we get an opportunity for these things to actually work. Um, and so I would be interested in that, I'm, uh, but I'm not interested in going backwards or adding, as some people have said, more restrictions or heavier restrictions. I don't think that's where I want to go. That's all I got, John. Thanks, Councillor Sweeney. We'll move on to Rebecca Norton. Rebecca. Thank you, John. Um, well, I'm a little shocked about the hospital already going to COVID patients. So I think we're in a much more serious place than we realized, um, given that um, the capacity at both hospitals might be exceeded shortly. So, um, so some of the comments that we've gotten over the last few weeks are one, do nothing. 
which I don't think any of us agree with. And number two is do something. Um, so we have been trying to um, to model other plans um, and follow the governor's directives. Um, it's been difficult to identify what we legally are have the right to do as a chartered city. So thank you, Angie, for all of that. We know that COVID is a brand new disease. There is no cure. Um, from everything I've been reading, it's unlikely that we'll have a vaccine for mass distribution before 2022. So our pandemic response for our nation is to contain the uh, virus with the hopes of eradicating it and not letting it spread while we wait on a vaccine. And so we as a chartered city do have the legal and constitutional right to intervene in a public health emergency. We have been trying to do this all along, keeping our hospitals functional and able to treat not only COVID patients, but other emergencies is a very big goal of, of getting through this. Um, <coughs> Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is that herd immunity is not really um, an option for COVID-19. Um, the antibodies to date only last for a few months, maybe four months um, is what they're finding with research to date. And then also that means that people don't have immunity. So already in our town, I know people who have been infected twice and the second infection shows up with different symptoms. So even if you have it once and you think you're protected, you actually could have a much more serious case of it the second time you get it. Um, and the disease is not only a few weeks long, some people will develop organ damage. It, it affects the, the, um, the whole body and so, um, we haven't even touched that kind of treatment for people that are long haulers yet. Um, and that's probably the next big bump in efforts um, is people that have survived and what they've developed as long term consequences of the disease. So I, um, I think we've done a lot of good to date. I was very happy to see that um, reminding people what we were hoping to achieve with Halloween to not produce a super spreader event actually worked and I really appreciate the businesses that did close down early rather than risk endangering their own employees or any of our citizens or visitors. Um, I, I think Ben's idea <laughs> of being um, changing our approach slightly to from occupancy to actually look at the the interior space of businesses. So some of the business owners I've talked to are um, just to maintain the safe space between people. They are already at 50% and they're functional at 50% financially. Um, other people might be able to stay at 75% if the distancing um, is maintained. And so I think maybe we could look at a little bit of flexibility between 50 and 75 percent as long as the the transmission route is safe between people. Um, I of course being in healthcare all these years would prefer that we were very stringent at this point. I think the the, the issue of it being a shoulder season um, and clamping down as much as we can before we have high visitation is a really good idea. I um, I think um, I would be up for reinstating our own mask ordinance with fines attached to that. I agree with Ben saying that the events are a trigger for spreading. Uh, and I I really appreciate especially um, the school district taking the lead and getting the task force going on um, on basing our decisions on data and metrics and making sure that we actually um, decrease the numbers of uh, 
of confirmed cases. Again, one other point that I'd like to make is that confirmed cases are not all the COVID in our community. The CDC itself has come out with data based on asymptomatic testing that shows that it's about 10 times the amount of confirmed cases that's spreading once you get to community spread. So it's very serious <laughs> that um, we had such lags in our testing for so long, but now that seems to be uh, much more available at KRMC. It's free through the a drive through process. I love the idea of getting rapid testing in whitefish and um, there are lots of different ways of testing is being evaluated all around the world right now. Um, but it would be really nice if we had something like that, <laughs> excuse me, um, sooner rather than later. So uh, lastly, I would strongly support hiring our own um, education outreach enforcement person, even if it's only through December. I think every day counts when you're dealing with something like this. And um, we we really can't be in denial that we we could be in for a really dark winter if we don't do everything we possibly can to contain the virus. It's unfortunate that the county uh, feels compelled to avoid the science that is um, pretty strong about how to stop the spread of COVID. Perhaps that will change after the election, I'm hoping. And that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Ryan. Yeah, I will say that I uh, echo what Frank and Andy said. Um, I think that um, Dave from the Remington and Alex and Sandra all brought up some very good points and kind of shed some light on um, just how difficult it is um, to be a business owner right now in this ever-changing uh, climate. And I would not be in favor of going back to having additional restrictions um, on businesses, but I would be in favor of you know, discussing what we can do, what kind of ordinances we, we could pass, what kind of enforcement we, we, um, we could look into, what kind of messaging we can get out there um, to ensure that uh, we are protecting the health of our community and we are making sure that um, the businesses can operate in ways that they need to. Um, and with that, I, I will, um, that's all I really have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hannon, very much. Steve Cornell. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple things. I do feel compelled to address some of the comments that were made just because I, I don't think, I don't feel like, I feel like not addressing them or be complicit in spreading um, rumors and mistruths. Uh, I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again here. The, the idea of wearing masks is not to prevent this, is not to prevent you from getting the disease. It's to prevent you from spreading the disease, whether you know you have it or you don't know you have it. So it's important that we wear masks. That is the purpose of it. <clears throat> um, another one and another comment that needs to be addressed is that you can't compare a non-contagious long-term disease to a fast moving, highly contagious and preventable disease. Uh, so the comparisons that we heard tonight in terms of death rates uh, really don't hold water in this case. Uh, and, um, and the idea that 80% of uh, positive cases are false positives, uh, it's not verified. I did some investigation today. It's not verified by any, any reputable source that, that I could find. Um, and with that said, I'd like to move on to what the real uh, purpose of what this meeting is about, and that's about what can we do? Um, what should we do? And what I'm hearing, number one, is about enforcement. Um, we could come up with the greatest set of restrictions that we could, but if we can't enforce it, it's not worth anything and it's not worth our time if we can't enforce it. So that is really the crux of the argument here. 
Um, and we're in the place we are is because there hasn't been enforcement. The county has been loath. The county attorney has done nothing. Uh, the county health board has refused to help out. And not until this late hour are we going to get one, we're going to finally get one single person to do all the investigations in the entire county. And I would venture that our businesses are doing a much better job than many of the businesses in the county as a whole in terms of um, sticking to the state, to the governor's order. Uh, we, we've had some bad actors um, and we, we were working on that, but uh, you know, enforcement is the key. Um, we don't wanna make it harder for businesses. Uh, that's definitely, uh, I'm certainly, uh, I'm, I'm um, it's going to be effective. Uh, the other thing I'm hearing, there's not a, there's not a lot of um, there's no there's not really support to go backwards in any restrictions. But we do want some element of local, um, and that is going to depend. If we do that, it's we're going to have to figure out how to enforce it. Um, the other thing that I want to say, uh, and one of the people brought this up. Um, somebody said, uh, you know, people are just going to go elsewhere and it's going to be spreading and it's community spread and we can't build a bubble around whitefish. That, th all those are true. All those are true. Uh, we also don't be complicit in closing our eyes and letting it just happen around us in our town. Uh, and that is, in my opinion, our biggest and greatest challenge and it is our job. It is why we ran um, so that we could lead this community. And none of us saw that we were going to be leading it through a pandemic, um, but nevertheless, here we are. So do we sit by, are we complicit, or are we going to do something? Um, and uh, I, I like, I, I do want to echo uh, what um, Councilor Davis said, that we need to look at the, we need to look at the spacing in bars and restaurants, and we also need to look at what we can do about gatherings of 25 or, I mean, 10, I think, in a house is quite, you know, there's no way you're going to be distancing in a house. Um, personally, anecdotally, two people at my school today were quarantined because they went to separate Halloween parties in Kalispell this weekend, and somebody there was sick. It's like, duh, you guys are teachers. Why are you going to a Halloween party in the middle of this pandemic? And that's, and you know, there's been all this talk about personal responsibility. People take it. Um, they're not doing it. Uh, and that's, that's the problem. That's why we are where we are. So um, I also want to thank Amy Sharp for, for really giving us a, a picture of begging my friends in the healthcare industry to come and talk to us. Uh, but thank you, Amy, for coming and saying, uh, what you said about the reality of it on the ground in the hospitals where people are sick. The eyes there do not lie. Um, you can't, you cannot argue with what you're seeing in our hospitals. And it is scary that North Valley is now accepting COVID positive patients after not accepting COVID positive patients for eight months now. Um, now uh, Dave and Sam, at the Remington for closing early on, well, I think that was a hard idea for and for uh, what could have created a, a pretty super spreader event. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that was the, uh, and so finally, that uh, brings me to the things that we can do. We need to figure out the enforcement piece. And I would like us to explore trying to be creative about how we're going to do this. We that 70% of our businesses comply. And, uh, I, I would like to see us have some incentive that are doing good. And that comes from my teacher brain uh, where, you know, the saying in education is that you need to give five positive reinforcement comments to every, everything, every, critical, every single one critical thing a child, uh, a student. Um, so I would love to 
incentive that we could offer to businesses who are caught doing the right thing. Um, that, that will ease the burden of what they have to do for sure. Um, and way back when we started looking at hotels and restricting hotels, I mentioned, so we're going to leave this up to the people on the front line to, to um, enforce this. And here we're hearing that we have 18 year old hostesses or six, some of them 15 or 16 years old telling people to put masks. The only person that I've seen that has been willing to really stand in somebody's face and tell them to put a mask on is Gretchen Boyer at the, at the farmer's market. I saw her multiple times this summer, stopping people as they were walking in only because of who she is that she was able to manage them. So um, it, we need to figure out a way to get people on the ground, catching people doing the right thing and enforcing the rules, whatever rules we come up with. Um, and we have something that allows us to have local control. Um, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, I think I've said enough at that, at this, um, so we can move on. Thank you. Th thanks very much, Steve. I would just take a minute here. I think a lot's been said by the council. I'm certainly not going to repeat the good comments that have been made, but I wanted to specifically thank uh, the businesses that came to speak with us tonight, the businesses that I know I've talked to over the last you know five or six months, as well as the residents that have um, come forward to, to share their concerns. Um, overwhelmingly, what I've heard, both from our discussions with Tam Lee last meeting, uh, the Whitefish City County Health Department health officer, um, is that the infections seem to be spreading from large events within the county. And there's just not a lot of data, in my opinion, substantiating that the cases we're seeing, whether it's in Whitefish or Columbia Falls or Kalispell, are indeed coming from just bars and restaurants. In fact, I hear just the opposite from the bar and restaurant owners that I speak with in the downtown who indicate to me that it's mostly coming from younger employees in their 20s that may work two or three jobs in the downtown and after their shift is over, they go out and they congregate and they get together with their friends and they party and they transmit the disease to each other. Then they come back to the workplace and they infect their, their fellow employees. And it's not necessarily patrons coming in and infecting our workers in the downtown. It's coming from within. And I think enforcement is one of the biggest gaps in data we have right now in terms of how, even if we were to adopt local ordinance, how can we even make them meaningful if we don't have an enforcement arm to deal with it? Um, I do feel, to Dave's point at the Remington, that enacting an ordinance that would just target restaurants and bars would not be very fair. It would be disproportionately affecting a pretty small sector of our economy for, quite frankly, probably minimal gain, unless I see data that tells me otherwise, but we haven't been privy to that information uh, yet. I want to leave, though, on a positive note. Um, we've recently convened through the help of LJ Communications and of course Dana, um, a COVID-19 response team. And some of you may not be aware of that, but Frank and I both participated on our first uh, meeting this past week. It involved uh, members from the school district, uh, the school district board and administrators, uh, health officials from North Valley Hospital, uh, Winter Sports Incorporated and other health uh, professionals. And I think what we, we ended up doing that evening is uh, creating this task force that is going to take a very aggressive approach when it comes to education, outreach, and messaging through PSAs and other public outreach measures so that we can con continue and start even more so to de delivering concise, consistent, and frequent messaging to our town regarding the true effects of this disease and what we can do to help protect both our residents and our visitors alike. And so I'm optimistic about that as we move forward. And I still, after hearing public comment tonight and the comments from the council, believe that 
pushing for more voluntary compliance through messaging is probably our best course of action at this point until I'm at least shown data that's more compelling that would help us you know, target via ordinance um, areas within our community that are driving you know, infection rates. I don't think, to Andy's point, I agree with Andy, that I don't think we're at a point where we can bring on a health education officer having brought on employees as a city council for 14 years. It's not something that happens overnight. It's a lengthy process. You have to advertise, and by the time we got someone on board, it would be the end of 2020, the funding would expire, and basically that position would be largely um, ineffective. What I would suggest coming out of tonight, though, is similar to what we did back in 2006, 2007, uh, when the economy was in dire straits, as we had on the agenda for every regularly scheduled meeting, a standing agenda item. And I would suggest to the council, and we can bring this up under council for comments, that we keep this front and center of all of our attention, that we add COVID-19 as a standing agenda item for all uh, future meetings, because I agree with all of you that our work certainly isn't done here, it's just beginning. Um, and we need to continue working on uh, means and effective means that we can help um, bring infection rates and bring this virus to a close just as soon as we can. So those are my comments. I'm not hearing that we're gonna see any um, action this evening, Dana, from the council in terms of direction to staff, unless I'm hearing otherwise from the council, now would be your last opportunity. Obviously, we're gonna discuss this at our next meeting again, but. Am I interpreting the council correctly that at this point we're not providing any further direction from staff? And I'll take a showing of hands if you have comments to that effect. I have a comment. Sure, go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, I, I know you guys are saying it's a short timeline for, um, for hiring someone for that position, but um, we probably would need them longer than just till December. So maybe there's funding through Governor Bullock that we could, um, when we we had talked about the idea of sending a letter in Dana's report, I think she said that, um, and, and asking if there's more help for the businesses through some of the CARES Act funding. And maybe there's also funding for a longer, um, uh, a longer position um, because I'm really uncomfortable with Dana and Michelle doing that, and I think it's a Agreed. complex. I think, I, I think it's I think it will be very helpful to have someone that actually works with um, businesses and um, in any situation actually to to just kind of um, uh, coach coach people about how to be safe with COVID. And it might not need to be um, like punitive in any way. It could just be like, okay, this is what we want to do. How does this sound? Is there anything we've forgotten? You know, because I do think our businesses have done an excellent job trying to um, be more more than what we've asked even. They did a, a wonderful job. But I, I really don't want to just throw out the idea that we couldn't have someone earmarked for that position that wasn't part of our existing staff because they've already had kind of a rough year already and we need to keep them safe. And if there are people that are trained for that role that we could get funding for, I'd like to at least pursue that as a way to <laughs> kind of like a segue between city oversight and people that need the help with coaching. I, I think you bring up a good point, Rebecca, and I certainly wouldn't argue that at all. I think it would be something that Dana would be willing to look into. Dana, any comments on that? Yeah, so Governor Bullock will not have any funds past December 31st unless, the, unless Congress acts and amends the CARES Act. Um, but that being said, you know, I think Obviously, staff time is a challenge. Um, it would be easier to have individuals dedicated to this. Um, luckily for our general taxpayers, the, the city isn't sitting here with a bunch of staff not doing stuff. Even in these uh, crazy times, they are keeping busy. And um, as you know, with your council goal update that I provided for you, there's a lot of goals on our, our list to accomplish along with this. Um, pandemic that we're managing. So staff would be helpful, 
Um, when we had the mask ordinance in place, I can tell you that we had 14 businesses that we had to do follow-up education and our compliance uh, task items, some with walkthroughs, some with letters. Um, we had a total of 28 complaints come through our online system as well. Um, and that was, we were managing those pretty well, Michelle and I, and then we would coordinate with the health department. Um, you know, if we were doing a phase two enforcement, uh, sticking with our current guidelines that are in place by the governor, then, you know, our enforcement would be kind of piggybacking off of the, their new education liaison, um, COVID education liaison position because we wouldn't want to duplicate that effort. Uh, we don't need businesses contacted twice, um, but I think there's ways to coordinate that. So that being said, you know, I do feel, I mean, I guess uh, unless other people feel differently, I felt like we did the best that we could to enforce the mask ordinance when we were allowed to for the 30 days that it was in effect, um, but know that that, that cut off uh, mid-August. So anything you saw, or maybe it was end of July actually, um, you know, that, that was a very short-term ordinance. So I, I think knowing the business community and how well they've done so far, I do think that enforcement is gonna come down to, you know, the, maybe the same 14 businesses um, that we already had to deal with before. Um, it's not gonna be the 300 retail and uh, bars and restaurants that we have. So um, professional offices, we don't, we don't see complaints about those. That's really not what we've been talking about. Um, you know, you, we get the supermarkets, the grocery stores, some retail, and then uh, bars and restaurants were, were what was really on our complaint, complaint list. So that's my comments. Thanks, Dana. Further comments from the council this evening? I'm not seeing any. Um, again, it would be my suggestion that we add this as a standing agenda item. Do I have the concurrence for council and you can simply give a head nod if you agree? Yeah, that. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Dana. Thank and you. appreciate your time this evening. We're going to go ahead and adjourn for about seven minutes. We've been going now for over two hours. We will reconvene at 9.25. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.
looks like we have everyone here. Michelle, do you mind just doing a quick roll call? Sure. Councillor Quinnell? I'm here. Councillor Sweeney? I'm here. Councillor Davis? Present. Councillor Hennon? Here. Councillor Fury? I'm back. And Councillor Norton? Present. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, we will move on to item 6A of our agenda. You do have Dana's written report and closed with the packet. Any questions for Dana? Not seen. One, Mayor. Rebecca. Yep. Um, I just wanted to ask Dana if you could go over the voting um, for election day tomorrow at once again for the public. Sure, no problem. Um, tomorrow, City Hall doors will actually be open at 7 a.m. Uh, we will have election judges here, and they will be here until 8 p.m. So you can come and drop off your ballot um, if you haven't done so already. Um, we've seen a good turnout and continue to see a flow of uh, people into City Hall to drop off their ballots over the past um, couple of weeks since we've been open to the public. Um, and we'll be just monitoring the situation should we have any uh, rallies and protests occurring outside City Hall um, to make sure that there's a, an easy entrance for anybody who's dropping off their ballot. It may be located um, near the parking structure on Baker Avenue. There's an entrance into City Hall um, or through the city's uh, main doors um, at, the, at the corner of 2nd and Baker. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Mayor, I just one other random question for Dana. What is the and I saw Craig earlier on the on the call. What is the current status of the pedestrian uh, underpass and the reconstruction of uh, Baker going north? Sure. Well, I know that we laid asphalt on the uh, east side, but Craig is on. So I'm going to turn it over to the expert who knows more about where that project is than I do right now. Did that unmute? Yes. Um, yeah, so the final four sections of the tunnel were placed today. Um, I anticipate that they will finish the retaining wall on the west side of the tunnel next week, and we should be paving the week after next. Um, so we are back on pavement for the first section of um, the, the tunnel and the final paving will happen the week after next. It'll, you know, based on the weather, it, it, it sort of depends, but I'm, I'm hoping that all of the concrete will be poured under the tunnel as well as connecting from Depot Park and um, on both sides. But it's been kind of a rough couple of weeks, so we'll see what happens. But um, we will have the, the viaduct open to full traffic here in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. That's what I wanted. Thank you. Any further questions from the council for Dana or any directors? Dana, anything additional to report on? You know, I think I'll just give a brief update of the task force. Um, we did meet uh, last Thursday. It was a great meeting, hearing from businesses, the hospitals, the school. Um, and what's occurred since then is there is with LJ Communications, who uh, we partner with the CBB to have them provide our crisis communications um, and uh, communication input. Um, they are working really, really hard on um, this this project, which is to help this task force come together with a concise, clear, frequent message, reaching out to the demographic that is seeing the most spread of COVID-19. So you're 20 to 49, maybe 59 year olds. Um, you'll target more than 50% of the COVID cases by, by looking at those groups. So pushing information out through social media, more having specific marketing surrounding our messaging. Um, a subgroup was created uh, with experts in the field of communications and marketing from uh, the hospital, the school district, obviously the city, the CBB, and then um, some other interested uh, business owners as well. So um, I think it'll be a really great uh, outcome for the community. I think what we heard tonight is that the businesses need this messaging for people when they show up. What what is what is Whitefish when you come visit us now? 
and not necessarily our out-of-staters. I think it's really coming from Kalispell, coming from Columbia Falls, or our locals. When you come visit our businesses, how, how what, what should be expected of you? And so um, we hold our next meeting on Thursday uh, with those um, with the entire group um, to review our our plan, our communications plan for the next couple months. Um, because obviously time is of the essence with this. We're working as fast as we can. So uh, that's an update about the task force. And I think that's, um, I think the only other thing that we need to consider is the, right now we're under the ordinance for remote meetings, but I think uh, whether it's the next meeting or the first meeting in December, um, I assume that the council will be uh, interested in, we'd have to do a new ordinance um, to continue similar remote workings into January, so. Um, I think, you know, we could get direction on that either at this meeting or next meeting. That would be great. Okay. Thanks, Dana. Uh, we'll go ahead and stay with Dana and move on to item 6C of the agenda, which will be resolution 20-39, a resolution authorizing participation in the short-term investment pool, Montana Board of Investment. Dana. Great, thank you. Um, so tonight um, on page uh, 139 of your packet is a resolution that uh, the city council needs to consider for us to continue with our short-term investment pool program investments. Um, the board, the Montana Board of Investments uh, is the um, authority for authorizing the use of this investment program. Um, STIP, which is what's short for, um, is available to state and local governments to serve um, for our short-term cash flow needs. So it's it, when we deposit funds into STIP, it's a 24-hour turnaround for us to receive our funds back. Um, they keep it very liquid uh, for that purpose. We do utilize STIP. Um, currently, though, our rates have gone from 0.2 uh, or, or from a year ago, a 1.97% return to 0.28% return. So you can see that the market has definitely taken a dive on the uh, rate of return for investments. That being said, our investments uh, through um, Morton Asset Management have actually remained very strong and we're, we're closer to that 2% average. Um, but that being said, with the hiring of uh, Finance Director Dahlman, uh, we do have to update this resolution. Um, he will be authorized as the um, representative to transact STIP, STIP on behalf of the city, and then designates, this, this resolution also designates and authorizes the bank account information um, and the earnings distribution method for the city's STIP investments. We just have that reinvest instead of distribute it. Um, the proposed STIP resolution does follow our investment policy, uh, which delegates authority of managing investments to our finance director under the direction of the city manager. There is no financial requirement with this resolution. Uh, we will just continue to monitor our um, investments based on the changing market conditions and cash flow needs. So staff respectfully recommends that the city council approve the resolution authorizing participation in the short-term investment pool and authoring the, authorizing the execution and delivery of documents related thereto. Thanks, Dana. We'll need a motion to that effect. Mr. Mayor, I would move to approve resolution number 20-39 a resolution authorizing participation in the short-term investment pool, otherwise known as STIP, the Montana Board of Investments. Thank you, Ryan. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councilor Sweeney. Further discussion? No. Nope. Those... Thanks, Ryan. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed actually shall roll call. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Councilor Quinnell? Yay. Councilor Sweeney? Aye. Councillor Davis? In favor. Councillor Hennen? Aye. Councillor Fury? In favor. And Councillor Norton? Aye. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. We'll move on to item 7A of our agenda. We did make appointments at our work session to various volunteer boards and committees. I'll just bounce through that list real quickly. Uh, for the public. Uh, we did appoint Tara Zimmerman to the Police Commission, Whitney Beckham to the Planning Board, John Middleton to the Whitefish Housing Authority, 
Chuck Stearns to our Impact Fee Advisory Committee, Jeremy Grossman to our Parking Pilot Program, Kate McMahon to our Climate Action Plan Committee, and finally, Leslie Hunt to our Parking Pilot Program, and thanks to all those that applied. And our next item is 7B, consideration of canceling the second meeting in December, which is a tradition, and this year falls on December 21, 2020, and we'll need, need a motion to that effect, if that's your word, direction. Mr. Mayor, I would move that we uh, cancel the second meeting in December, um, as is our tradition. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hennon. Further discussion? Michelle, roll call, please. Councillor Quinnell? Yay. Councillor Sweeney? Was that a yay? <laughs> Sweeney? Okay. <laughs> uh, Councillor Davis? In favor. Councillor Hennon? Aye. Councillor Fury? In favor. And Councillor Norton? Aye. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, finally, uh, comments from the council. We'll go ahead and start this evening. I'll just go straight down the same list. Uh, Councillor Fury, any comments as we close out tonight? Uh, I guess just one question going back to the parking pilot program interviews tonight. We only had three applicants and we had four positions and I understand your reasoning on Mr. Mr. Fury that you know, they'll be moving out of there, but I would still support him for the daytime employee railway district position. I mean, he's been there for eight years and he's going to be there for sounds like at least another seven or eight months and hopefully the committee will wrap up. I think he has probably a, a reasonable amount of experience. So I guess if we'd had more applicants and then we had positions, I might, might agree with you on that one, but I don't know. Does anybody else think that's a good idea? Mm. If I, I perhaps was confused when we spoke before the work session or at the start of the work session, and Michelle, I thought you indicated that it was either Leslie Hunt or Tyler representing the daytime employee category, or was I mistaken there? No, that's correct. The way that the resolution is written, it's calling for eight or nine individuals to be on the the committee. We have a few that, you know, the business owners and managers, we have two of those that are required. Um, we have one, we have a daytime employee that's required, a nighttime employee that's required, and then also a member residing in the permit area. Um, it's a difficult committee to fill with all those requirements. Um, so I would think, and maybe Angie can help me with this, if council designates, because um, we really do need somebody that's in the railway district, I think that's very important, whether he's, you know, a resident of the district or an employee of the district, I think that would be a really good thing to do. But um, I think the council could probably make that designation. What do you think, Angie? I think so too, Michelle. I completely agree. So if I were to make, I think these are my appointments. So can I simply motion to appoint Tyler Fury as the railway district representative? Yes, I believe so. That would work. Okay. Well, so moved. And I'll just need a showing of hands from the council to appoint uh, Tyler Fury. Hi. Thanks, Rebecca, and that's unanimous, Michelle. Thanks for bringing that up, Manny. Perfect. Yeah, I just Thank you. just seemed like he had some pretty good insight, probably to an area that does have some problems. Um, I don't have too many other things. I just did want to ask Craig, as as long as he's still on there, it seems like the road closed sign from Wisconsin on to Skiles has been there for like ever. And people are just driving through there. And is it there for a reason? I mean, what's the, or they just want to have their own private road there now? And it's John said by your office. I don't know, but it's like I just drove by today and look at his car driving through there. And there's still half of it covered up with a road close sign, which has been there for six weeks now, probably. It's kind of. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, John had requested that we keep that sign up. Should we should we take it down? <laughs> um, I, it's funny you mention it because I've had a couple of conversations with that contractor. Um, they do still have some trench patch work that needs to happen on Skiles, and so the road will likely be closed one more time for a couple of hours, but I'll, I'll make sure we take care of that. There's a number of kind of lingering sign road construction issues throughout town that I've been trying to wrap up here before plows start knocking them into front yards. So um, we'll, we'll make sure we take care of that here in the next week. Yeah, I just have seen a couple of sketchy terms there because part of the north, you know, the westbound lane is covered and somebody pulling up and then you got somebody on the bike path and somebody's trying to make a left turn off of Wisconsin and it gets a little tight in there with the sign. That was kind of my concern more than yeah. anything. So okay. anyway, um, and then just one last thing. I do want to congratulate the uh, Whitefish High School boys soccer team for their third state championship in a row and a pretty impressive um record of one tie in three years that's a pretty amazing record for for a team of anyone that's a they're a young team and we certainly want to congratulate Columbia Falls too they're a very young team and I got a feeling we may see similar similar matchup next year but anyway congratulations to all of those guys I know they work hard and play hard and they're a bunch of a bunch of good young men so congratulations yep. to them thanks Andy Ben comments this evening uh no further comments from me thank you Thank you, Ben. Councilor Sweeney. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I think I, the only thing I've got in terms of uh, uh, things I've seen that we probably ought to take a look at is the area of 93 going into town, basically from uh, where it goes from two lanes to four lanes or four lanes to two lanes going northbound. That section going up towards uh, uh, the stoplight at second um, is getting in a little rough shape. I don't know whose responsibility it is for us to take care of that, to take care of that, whether that's us or the state, but uh, it's noticeable. Um, so we probably ought to at least talk to the state if they're responsible for doing it or whether we are, but uh, it probably ought to go, go on the list. The only, I don't have anything else this evening other than that. And uh, uh, this has been a, this is this issue that we were dealing with this evening it's causing all kinds of soul searching as to what we can do and how we can be effective and how we can be helpful um, because we can't fully open up until we get this thing conquered or managed um, and so uh, that at least has been my goal and i think that's been our collective goal is how we can move forward to best facilitate opening with uh with everybody trying to be careful so thanks that's all i've got Thank you, Frank. Rebecca. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody that has voted and will be voting tomorrow. Um, we have two drive through um, ballot collection places, one at the fairgrounds and one in the alley behind the election department in Kalispell. And it's looking like it will be the highest turnout ever in Montana. And so no matter which party you support, it still shows that you care about our country and you care about our democracy. And so um, we are, you know, the representation of democracy for you. And um, it's very meaningful to see so many people engaged um, to make their future the way they want it to manifest. So I just wanted to say that. that it's a beautiful thing to me. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. And Ryan, comments tonight? Uh, nothing for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ryan. And finally, Steve. Uh, thanks, John. Um, just a couple things. First of all, I want to thank staff for uh, putting together the information on such short notice. I, I know that it was a lot, and I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, you know, we're living in unprecedented times and we're all trying to do our best through this whole thing. And, uh, you know, patience is wearing thin all over the place. Um, so we've never seen anything like this before. Um, and I hope once we get this behind us, we won't see anything like it again in our lifetimes. Um, the other thing, uh, I, I was approached by 
uh, Amber Sherrill, she's a city councilor in Missoula, to see if we would um, be interested in adopting, they, they have some, they have a draft ordinance um, about uh, banning uh, flavored vape uh, juice in Missoula. And they were, they wondered if we might be interested in considering similar, um, if we might be interested in considering similar, a similar ordinance here. Um, and if there's enough interest from the council, uh, I would see if we could put it on a, they could, I asked her if they would be willing to do a presentation at a work session for us on what they're talking about and what the science is and what their draft ordinance is. I was contacted by her as well, Steve. I appreciate that you circled back with her. I just haven't had time uh, this summer and fall to do so. Um, in order to get that on a future agenda or even in front of us at a work session, it would just require a simple show of the majority of the hands of the council members here tonight, if, if that's your desire. If there's, I, I would, if there's enough support, I think it, it's not something, it's something we could look at for sure. Okay, showing of hands. I would support it. <laughs> okay. And I would support that as well. So I think we'll, Add that to a future agenda, if possible. And thanks for bringing that to our attention, Steve. Anything further? Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. I I want to circle back real quickly, and I'm not going to harbor on this much longer because we deliberated this evening. But is Chief Dial still on the phone? Yes. You there, Chief? You're muted, Chief. <clears throat> Star three. And it's this is probably a question for Dana, Angie, and Bill. And again, I don't want to belabor this. It can be a quick discussion because it is late. But the fact that we have been sending officers, men and women in uniform through our bars and restaurants for that matter and businesses um, doing quasi enforcement. Obviously, as a city, we can't enforce the state directives, only the county can unless we adopt by ordinance, the ability to enforce state directives. Otherwise, we're solely at the mercy of county enforcement and self policing. I guess my question to the three of you is if we are going to continue doing these quote patrols and quasi enforcement measures, does it make sense for us to adopt or at least consider an ordinance to give us the authority to do so? And I, I guess I'll first defer to Angie on that question. Sure, John, um, it would, um, you know, it, it's where we're relying right now on the you know, health department and the county to enforce it. And, you know, we haven't seen any enforcement from the county attorney. So if you folks were even willing to, you know, enact an ordinance that just reenacts the governor's, what, what is in place already now, it, it will give us some enforcement incentive. However, I mean, our hands are kind of tied to a certain degree. I mean, we're, we're stuck with $300, $500, um, pulling a business license, um, which is, you know, a process too. But really what we're stuck with right now is, um, yeah, it's with the governor's ordinance and it's with the county at this point. So, I mean, that would be the upside of enacting an ordinance, even just reinstating what the governor's directive was, is we could, to a certain degree, given manpower, uh, enforce it locally. Is, would that be your recommendation, Angie, considering, you know, what, what we're doing now currently on the streets with our police force? And Angie looks frozen. Angie, you're muted. Am I muted now? Yeah, you're kind of breaking up. Uh, 
Um, Angie, you're muted again. I don't know if there's a delay in yours, so it keeps muting you. Go ahead. Okay. Give it a second and I'll talk while you just sit there and maybe your stuff will, <laughs> your system will catch up. Um, one of the things that I just want to make clear and uh, is that, you know, our patrol officers do walk through bars always anyways you know that's one of their protocols is just check on the the situations and so they've kind of started that up again and obviously during the hall halloween weekend and the, those restrictions they were looking for those restrictions and again they weren't doing anything other than getting the body cam um info and then opening a case and they would write a report on what they saw um they aren't you know they aren't talking to the businesses at that moment in time. Um, to my understanding, um, it was only uh, obtaining the information to provide to our deputy attorney to uh, move forward with that. That being said, the directives do um, only state that the county attorney um, through the health department can enforce the current directives. So, um, you know, if the council wants to put forward an emergency ordinance, with the governor's phase two guidelines as written right now, then uh, we could move through with enforcement. Um, I think one of the things that we'd have to do though is be prepared to actually enforce that regardless of, you know, we shouldn't put in an ordinance in place unless we plan to enforce it. So that's just my thoughts there. Angie, are you on now by phone only? Nope, thought I saw her come in. No, I'm back, sorry, sorry. I got internet connection right now, guys. Still breaking up, Ange. Why don't we hear from Chief Dial? Because I, I agree with Dana 100%. I'm not interested in legislating unless it's effective and meaningful. And if it's not enforceable, then there's no point in doing so. But I'll, I'd love to hear from Chief Dial if he's still around. Michelle, can you unmute him? I've been trying. Oh. <laughs> okay, Chief, don't it's touch your phone. Question. Michelle, unmute him. <laughs> it sends the, a request to unmute, and then... Oh. Chief, maybe try to unmute your, your phone on your phone pad. I guess, John, you know, when you say, can we enforce it? Obviously our officers will continue to do their walkthroughs um, like they always do, but the enforcement will not go directly to our police department. That's gonna lie with, uh, you know, they can do some reporting on anything they see, but again, I know that people don't think the complaint system is the right process, but that is if you actually follow through with the complaints, it, it does work. Um, you know, we, we spent numerous times walking through facilities and talking to them and uh, educating them. And then eventually you stop getting the complaints. And at that point, you know that they've taken the steps that they needed to. I, I think that that's, you know, it's gonna be a mix. Obviously, if we're to, to enforce the governor's directives would be our officers still doing their normal walkthroughs, getting the body cam footage, writing up case reports as they need. And then um, on our side, that those would be forward to the, to the prosecuting attorney. And then, um, you know, on the complaint driven side, obviously we can't be everywhere. I mean, you're talking about every business potentially in Whitefish having some type of restriction. Um, and so we can't be everywhere at, at one time. So having those complaint process also available is important. So, you know, we have our website set up to provide complaints for online for the mask wearing that can be easily changed to all governor directives um so there is a process already in place for us to do that it would just fall to probably michelle and myself and maybe we can get assistance from another department we have to see well we're not going to put you in that in that situation as rebecca noted earlier and i the, the only reason i brought this up at the end of the meeting is because it was referenced in angie's and your staff report and it didn't really get discussed during our comments earlier and i just wanted to make sure that you know, we're providing our police department all the tools they need to do what they're currently doing and it sounds as though you're comfortable with the complaint based process and i think we should just move forward with that so i appreciate the um the feedback on that 
Well, and John, for the complaint based process to work, though, I mean, we can't go any further than just, you know, maybe calling to educate somebody on the current governor's directives, but we have no enforcement past that. Because I understand. Right now, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that's clear that, that there's no okay. business license pulling or civil citations at this point. We can educate. And, um, you know, I think that that's something the health department's fine with us doing is educating what the governor's directives are if we do okay. receive complaints. Okay. Do those, Steve, do those complaints also go to the health department, though? Because, I mean, that's that's the enforcement arm. Right. So when we did get complaints through our site, we did forward those to the health department. Um, if we start, we haven't been getting them through our site, um, but we can. What's going to happen with this new education liaison position is those that person's not only going to deal with the complaints the health department gets directly, but also the one that's at the state level now. So the state set up a website that collects complaints. They're forwarding those complaints to the health department. So there's really already two means of complaint systems. Um, and that's why they had to hire a new person to focus on those state complaints, because I think what they're anticipating is more people will file complaints with the state and then the state can monitor those more directly. My understanding as of right now, it's very complicated. And I, I do, there are concerns that you have one more complaint system. How do you combine all three? It, it could become challenging. Understood. Uh, Chief Dial finally got himself unmuted, so I want to hear from him. <laughs> am, I, am I unmuted? Can you finally hear me? We can hear you. All right. Can you hear me, John? I can. Okay. Um, you know, we'll do uh, whatever we uh, are tasked with doing. But one thing I want to, uh, the council to keep in mind, you know, we're... Um, <clears throat> And generally, we're operating with two officers, um, except on, on weekends, and we'll have three. And right now, you know, uh, over the weekend, I just looked at our our case reports. So we're at uh, almost fourteen thousand case reports for the year. Um, so, yes, we take COVID as a very serious uh, issue, but you know, we have to prioritize what we respond to. Um, like, like I said, over the weekend, I'm. Halloween night, we had four DUIs. Uh, we're not going to go and force a COVID uh, issue when we have drunks run all over the street. Um, you know, it's it's got to we have to prioritize. Um, but uh, conversely, our people, my staff, has been very receptive uh, to doing what uh, is right, and we do believe in doing as much as we possibly can. So. Uh, uh, we're going to put our heads together and see if we can come up with some other ideas too. And if, if we do, then I will pass that along to Dana and pass along to you guys. No, I, I know you guys have been doing everything you absolutely can, Bill, and I want to please extend your appreciation from this council to all your, your officers, please, because I do know it's a difficult time, especially for you. And um, thanks for your, your, your comments. Yep, we'll do that. Thank you. I think I'm done. I think most of us are done. Any further comments from the council? Dana, how about staff? We're good. All right. We'll see everyone in a couple weeks. Um, be safe and thanks for your time tonight.